Coming up from Call to Mind, postpartum depression is one of the most common complications after childbirth, but many people who suffer feel they can't talk about it. Having the postpartum depression was really surprising to me, and I felt really ashamed, so I lied about it for a long time. And experts say there are many reasons that people go untreated. We put the responsibility of why postpartum depression happens squarely on the shoulders of women, and they already feel it when actually we as a country and as a community are failing. I'm Kimberly Adams. Over the coming hour, we talk about postpartum depression. We'll hear from people who've lived through it and from mental health providers who say it's treatable and no one should suffer alone. No woman or other pregnant person needs to suffer. There are effective treatments and people need to make sure they're getting treated. Birth and Depression, the unspoken conversation from Call to Mind. First, the news. You're listening to Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from Call to Mind, American Public Media's initiative to foster new conversations about mental health. I'm Kimberly Adams. I had postpartum depression with all three of my children. My first baby, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was first screened for it at one of my daughter's pediatrician visits, and I immediately checked all the boxes for postpartum depression. I thought I would feel like an instant loving connection, but it was like someone dropped a demanding alien in my life. My husband was scared to the point that he would lock himself in a room with our daughter some nights because my mental health was so on the decline. My anxiety over her safety was through the roof. Like I could not function. I was terrified of being alone with my child. I was afraid of myself. I was afraid of anything sharp in the kitchen. All I could think about was what could happen to my Henry. I could not look at her for a couple of days to a week. I would feed her and I would pass her off. I was happy that she was here, but I didn't feel that connection for a couple of months with her. I love her to death. I do. She is just amazing. But um, when she was born, I had some trouble connecting with her. The voices you just heard are a few of the people who recorded and shared their stories with us about postpartum depression and other mental health issues during and after pregnancy. We'll hear more from them throughout the program. There's a myth in our society that if a person is pregnant or just had a baby, it's supposed to be the happiest time of their life. Who could possibly feel bad after experiencing such a miracle? While many are afraid to talk about it, the reality is a lot of people struggle with their mental health during pregnancy and after they give birth. Postpartum depression is one of the most common complications of childbirth, more common than gestational diabetes or even problems during labor. Yet 75% of postpartum mental health issues go untreated. We start in Minnesota, where Kyra Miles from NPR News caught up with some moms. At his home in Minneapolis, 5 p.m. is baby Asan's meal time. You gotta slow down, boo-boo. You gotta slow down. At five months postpartum, his mom, Cassidy Romaine, says she's been doing good, which is very different from her last two pregnancies. In her first, she went into premature labor. So I ended up having a girl, and she survived like two days, and we had to end up just like pulling the plug on her. And then um, maybe like a year later, I ended up getting pregnant with Antonio. With her now 13-year-old son, Romaine says she felt like she was holding her breath the whole pregnancy, still grieving the loss of her daughter. It wasn't until 10 years later that she realized she experienced prenatal and postpartum depression. She loves being a mom, but those early days were hard. It's all, it can be almost like suffocating because it's like now this human being is depending on you. Perinatal depression is common and treatable. It's not just sadness. It can look like a variety of personality changes. I call it the perinatal perfect storm. That's Dr. Helen Kim, a reproductive psychiatrist and director of the Hennepin Healthcare Mother-Baby Program located in Minneapolis. 
So there's a developmental change. There's also the psychological change of identity shifts and the grief and loss of becoming. A, I think this is often not, not, not talked about, the grief that people feel in becoming parents. She says it can be even harder when patients are hospitalized due to postpartum depression or anxiety. That's why her work focuses on family healing. Kim says it's imperative that new families have support from their communities, but also from policy, like equitable parental leave, health insurance, or child care. If we only focus on the hormones and the identity, we put post the responsibility of why postpartum prenatal depression happens squarely on the shoulders of women. And and they already feel it. Like they feel like they are failing their children when actually we as a country and as a, a community are failing. About one in seven mothers experiences postpartum depression, and it's even higher in communities impacted by historical or systemic oppression. Rebecca Polston is a midwife and the founder of Roots Community Birth Center in North Minneapolis. She says she's heard of mothers who ask for help only to have Child Protective Services called on them. People being looked down on for using the crisis nursery when they need to, to keep themselves and their children safe. We really have a stigma about people asking for help and admitting that there's a problem. One thing Polston says she's learned is that depression is rarely treated in isolation. And one of the best treatments is being connected to other people. What we have working for us is our culture. What we have working for us is our community. So that's where our solutions lie. I think you woke up too early, baby. (laughs) With her now two-year-old, Rachel Lowe experienced postpartum depression that she says left her feeling lost and misunderstood. When she got pregnant with her daughter, she vowed not to go through that again. It's like a 180 between my two children as far as how I felt. They're still great. They're amazing. They're taken care of. But I can tell a huge difference in my mental health once I poured into me. She created a self-care routine in a community of parents, friends, and family. And she let them help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you less of a mother. It's it literally takes a village. For Call to Mind, I'm Kyra Miles from NPR News. Postpartum depression is complicated. Experts can't pinpoint why some people develop it and others don't. But researchers can agree it's a complex medical condition that's likely caused by a combination of genetics, life experiences, and environmental factors. So to understand postpartum depression, we spoke with Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody. She's the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and directs the Center for Women's Mood Disorders at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Meltzer Brody starts by explaining the difference between postpartum depression and what many call the baby blues. Baby blues is something that happens in the overwhelming majority of people that give birth. It's um, close to... 80% or more, it's feeling more emotional, maybe crying more, feeling like you're on a hormonal roller coaster. And it really is associated with the physical exhaustion of giving birth, all the hormonal changes that happen during that time. In general, it lasts less than two weeks and people get their sea legs and are able to adjust. In contrast, postpartum depression can be serious. Now you can have a range of symptoms more mild to very severe, but it is something that is clinically significant and needs to be treated in some way. When you talk about postpartum depression, in general, you're talking about someone who is now postpartum, who is having clinically significant mood, often co-occurring anxiety symptoms that is impairing functioning. For Mothers and other postpartum people who are having postpartum depression, it is something that is not their fault. It comes on because of complicated biologic, psychologic, social factors and how they intersect in any particular person. And the symptoms are severe enough to cause impairment in functioning. What are some of the risk factors for these postpartum mental health issues? So a previous history of anxiety and depression in the postpartum period is the greatest predictor. A previous history of anxiety and depression in general. Poor social support is a risk factor. First baby is a risk factor. Poverty, um, 
and traumatic experiences, history of early adverse life experience or traumatic experiences is a risk factor. It's a risk factor for all depression and anxiety um, that we see. And a previous history of times of mood and anxiety symptoms triggered by great hormonal change. So one of the things we see is the transition from pregnancy to postpartum is a time of profound hormonal and other biological changes in a person's body, as well as just the birthing experience. It's such a profound time and such a vulnerable time. Can you sort of walk us through what the experience of postpartum depression or anxiety is for somebody going through it? You often will see people feeling sad, tearful, overwhelmed, the feeling that the demands of caretaking feel like it's more than they can deal with. They often feel like they're doing a terrible job, do not feel attached to the baby, or conversely are so overwhelmingly anxious about how the baby is doing that it becomes overwhelming to be around the baby. And um, in the more severe cases, feeling that Um, Everyone will be better off if they're not there and having thoughts that life is not living or active thoughts of, of hurting themselves. For people that have more mild, moderate symptoms, it can just feel being extremely overwhelmed, feeling that this was a terrible mistake, that they're not cut out to be a mother. And all of this can be made much worse by other psychosocial stressors, not having good support. Um, Not having financial security, certainly poverty can make things worse um, as it makes most things worse. Um, Having unrealistic expectations of sort of what they're supposed to be doing, pressures to return to work very quickly. Any of these things can sort of heighten um, all of the anxiety and worry and intensity. Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody says prenatal care has changed a lot over the last 20 years. There are more routine screenings during pregnancy, which include wellness checks. And after someone gives birth, standard follow up appointments should include mental health evaluations and screenings for depression. The whole idea is to identify as early as possible if someone has a problem and, like any other medical issue, refer them to appropriate follow up care and start a treatment plan. But Dr. Meltzer Brody says there are still gaps in how people are treated. So I think that it's the best it's ever been. Kimberly, and and yet at the same time, there's so much more we need to be doing. So I think there's more awareness now than there's ever been before. And I think there's more access to treatment than there's ever been before. But unfortunately, not everyone is screened. Not everyone that's screened is referred to treatment or there's not treatment available. If you're living in many different places, you can't access psychotherapy services, even if you want it. And there still remains stigma around accessing medications, both standard antidepressant treatments um, as well as the new drugs specifically approved for postpartum depression. And those um, are much more costly. They are very effective, but um, access potentially can be an issue. And I think that we have to do a better job of ensuring that all people who are screened are receiving treatment and treatment to ensure response and um, efficacy. You mentioned the benefit of sort of virtual screenings, but I have to imagine that physical location and and where a person lives matters a lot more when it comes to follow-up and and monitoring. It can. And I think that we've gotten really good. um, And I think nationally now, there are so many different options for telemedicine and telepsychiatry. But having someone track that and making sure people don't get lost through the cracks is incredibly important. It's so important because postpartum mood and anxiety disorders are one of the most common complications of childbirth. And if untreated, they have very adverse consequences for the child's development um, through adolescence. So Kids of of mothers that are not treated for postpartum mood and anxiety disorders have um, less good outcomes. We know that obviously it can be extremely detrimental to the woman, to her mental health, to the patient's family. Um, And just lost work days, the economic impact on the um, person's 
sort of financial hit on the family, the impact on relationship with partner, spouse can be markedly impact relationship with other children. So it can be something that really can be devastating for the family. And for all of those reasons, making sure someone is adequately treated is so important. That was psychiatrist Samantha Meltzer Brody from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am a 49-year-old woman. Jennifer lives in Southern California. I have one 13-year-old daughter, and I experienced postpartum depression and anxiety with her after four rounds of IVF trying to get pregnant with her. So having the postpartum depression was really surprising to me and really hard. And I felt really ashamed. So I lied about it for a long time. And finally, my husband realized that I needed help. And luckily, I was able to find a therapist who helped me get better. But other than that, there was nobody that told me that there was the potential that I would have experienced postpartum depression and anxiety after having IVF. Apparently, there's a really big Um, indicator that that can happen. And so after getting better, now I work for an organization that helps with that stigma. It's been something that I've really dedicated myself to so that no other woman has to experience those feelings that I experienced. You're listening to Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from Call to Mind, American public media's initiative to foster new conversations about mental health. I'm Kimberly Adams. Treatments for postpartum depression and other pregnancy-related mental health concerns have come a long way. The first step is often talk therapy with a mental health provider, and if someone needs more support, medication might be the next step. But many people worry about taking medicine while they're pregnant or after giving birth. We hear again from Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody. I think that there's always concern, and and justifiably so, for any pregnant person to take medication while pregnant or during breastfeeding postpartum. And that's obviously you're thinking about the impact on the individual and potentially on the infant or earlier if it's late pregnancy and the fetus. And those are important considerations. However, not treating is more detrimental. And there is stigma around mental health in general. There's still significant stigma around not feeling like I'm good enough, being concerned that if you tell a medical professional what's going on, someone will take your baby, that you'll not be seen as adequate. There remains stigma around any kind of mental health issue, and particularly for women that feel like they're in a really vulnerable place. At the same time, I'm encouraged by the fact that the conversation now is so different I think that social media, while certainly a double-edged sword, people are sharing and talking in very different ways. And generationally, our young people are talking about mental health in a very open way. So speaking of some of those valid concerns that you mentioned people have, like, let's, let's address a couple of questions that often come up here. For people who are taking same medication for a mental health condition before they were pregnant, Can they keep taking those through pregnancy and stay on their medications? So everyone who's taking a medication when they become pregnant needs to talk with their doctor about what they're taking and is it safe during pregnancy. And that's across the board of all kinds of medications. Medications for any number of medical illnesses, medications for mental health condition. Many medications for mental health conditions are safe to take during pregnancy. There's a few that are... Um, less safe, and that would be a discussion between the doctor and the patient. Another concern you mentioned people have is around breastfeeding. Does a person have to stop taking medication if they want to breastfeed? No, they do not. And so there are many ways that we can ensure that mothers can take the medications they need and breastfeed. The one thing that's critical is that you have to be treated for your mental health condition 
during pregnancy and during the postpartum period in the same way you need to be treated for any other medical condition. So saying just stop the medication and just, you know, deal with this, that's not acceptable at all. The outcomes can be poor, very poor, and impacting across two generations. So we have great options for treatment. No woman or other pregnant person and postpartum person needs to suffer with untreated postpartum depression and anxiety or any other mental health condition. There are effective treatments and people need to make sure they're getting treated. And so if there's anything that comes out of this discussion today, um, it would be to say, no one's suffering from a mental health condition. It's not your fault. You have done nothing wrong. Um, No different than any other medical condition. There are effective treatments and to make sure that you're getting effective treatments. If we have these screenings, if we have good treatment options, what are some of the top reasons that people who need help don't get it? Many people are not educated enough about postpartum or perinatal mental health conditions. If you're somewhere where you have a clinician providing obstetrical care who's not informed about these things, you may not be asked. And this should not be something that's hit or miss. I think it's much better than it was, but it's not perfect. If you are asked about it, then people can be reluctant to talk about it. Or maybe they're screened and then they're given a referral option for something that doesn't easily work out. So if you're, if you're told to call someone for psychotherapy and you can't get in for the next appointment for many months, that's not helpful. Figuring out what's the payment model around it. Does your insurance, does your health insurance cover it? Do mothers feel that they can make the time for it? Are their family members supportive or, or is there sort of pressure in the family to not take medication or you should just be able to deal with this? What's the matter with you? And so I think that my hope is that we get to a place where everyone sees taking care of the mother and the mother's mental health as one of the most critical things we can do. Because if you're taking care of the mom, then you are, by definition, taking care of the baby, too. And we need moms to be healthy and thriving for babies to do well. And so this is something that's on all of us um, to make sure we see as a priority. That's psychiatrist Samantha Meltzer Brody from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll hear about a new FDA-approved medication that is highly effective in treating postpartum depression. But the challenge is, who can get this new pill? That's coming up on Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a call to mind special from American Public Media. Welcome back to Birth and Depression, the Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from Call to Mind, American Public Media's initiative to foster new conversations about mental health. I'm Kimberly Adams. We've heard that when a person is battling postpartum depression, they can feel overwhelmed, anxious, lonely, and disconnected. The most severe cases can include suicide ideation or even death by suicide. So postpartum depression isn't painful for just the person living with it. The illness can be tough for everyone around them, partners, close friends, and other children in the family. When we asked for your stories about postpartum depression, we heard from dozens of people. Call to Mind's Jessica Bari caught up with one family. It's a late afternoon. Three-year-old twins Pavel and Winona are busy. It's playtime and snack time. They show me their favorite toys. And we practice colors. That's orange. The family's home is in a nice Minneapolis residential neighborhood. There are big trees in the yard and a screened-in front porch where the twins like to play. Their mom's name is Najwa. She's 36 years old and she glows when she looks at her twins. You'd never imagine, not that long ago... She was fighting a terrible depression. I felt like I was drowning. I would get like tiny little breaths of air. (laughs) I just felt like I was going to be underwater forever. And it felt like there was no relief 
coming, which is not to say I didn't have like moments of joy or happiness because I still would have those, but they were, they were very fleeting. And then it would kind of be back down into that like dark, alone place. After she had her babies, Najwa was suffering from undiagnosed postpartum depression and anxiety. People who have multiple pregnancies like twins or triplets are at a higher risk for postpartum mental health problems. Hello, my name is Najwa. Najwa wrote her story down and shared it with us in a voice memo. Prior to pregnancy, I had experienced mild to moderate anxiety throughout my life, but nothing unmanageable. I was wholly unprepared for my own postpartum depression and anxiety when I experienced it. I felt completely overwhelmed and helpless once my twins were born. It was like living in a hamster wheel and dreading the never-ending cycle. I questioned every parenting decision I made. I went to bed crying and I woke up crying. I loved my children and I never wanted to hurt myself, but I simultaneously wanted to disappear. My desire to love and care for my children is the only thing that got me through. Day by day, minute by minute, it started to get a little better, but it took me almost 18 months to feel like some version of myself again. Najwa and her husband, Dimitri, had their twins in May of 2021, and it wasn't an easy time. The twins were born small and needed some extra days in the hospital. Two months after the babies arrived, Dimitri's father passed away, and it was a major loss in his life. Dimitri didn't realize Najwa was struggling. For me to even look outside my own lens was maybe impossible or at least really difficult. Um, I didn't even consider that the that it was postpartum. I knew that she was struggling, but I didn't even put the two together. I just thought it's hard to be a mom. We have twins. Nobody's sleeping good. I mean, I was like, yeah, I'm struggling too. I didn't think that there was, it was like a medical condition or a mental health condition or anything like that. I just thought, yeah, this is hard. So we're having a hard time. With so much going on, it's easy to wonder if Najwa was dealing with a postpartum mental health problem or just getting through a difficult season. I still, even to this day, sometimes will like be like, well, I mean, but I had twins and my father-in-law just died and everybody has the baby blues. So I'll have those thoughts. But then I see other women in my life having babies and I see like they have that window of maybe a couple weeks where they seem very fragile and vulnerable. They seem to light up again and they seem like they're doing pretty good. And then when I look back at myself, I'm like, well, that was not the case for me. Najwa said she felt bad for over a year. She and Dimitri are close and she has a strong support network around her, but... Well-intentioned people do brush it off. And they're like, yep, you're a new parent. You know, everybody goes through this. And even if that was true, like even if every woman experienced postpartum depression and anxiety, even if that was common, like it, that doesn't make it less hard or terrible. Najwa got routine mental health screenings during her pregnancy, as well as in appointments after the babies were born. The screenings are like a survey with a series of questions. Najwa answered honestly, but was never referred for any kind of follow-up care with a mental health provider. It was actually the twins' doctor who realized there was a problem. Every time we went to the um, pediatrician, I was given that same survey to do. And I kept scoring worse and worse and worse on it. And so the pediatrician would, like, every visit, he would kind of gently bring it up to me. And then at a certain point, he was very adamant that I should start going to see a therapist. So she got connected to a therapist who confirmed she was dealing with depression and anxiety. The therapy gave her a place to talk every week and learn coping skills for the tough days. She would give me like some concrete things to try and just things as simple as, you know, she would say like, when you're feeling totally overwhelmed, just close your eyes and listen to the sounds around you dig into your like five senses and like see if that can ground you in the moment. And it did make a big difference for me. And then I think just like time helped for me. I eventually started going back to some of like my hobbies and interests that I had had prior to being pregnant and prior to COVID and the pandemic and everything. So that also just helped to start like going back to like some other communities outside of just like me and the kids only. 
People who've dealt with postpartum mental health problems describe one overwhelming theme, guilt. We heard from a lot of people who thought they didn't deserve to feel badly. Najwa was one of them. I felt really guilty and I still feel guilty because I feel like, although I cared for them well and I know that, I feel like I wasn't present. I feel like I didn't enjoy them like... This sounds dumb because it's like I didn't enjoy them the way I should have because I could not relax. I couldn't like come down. And I obviously I have I had beautiful moments that I enjoyed them and that we giggled and laughed and gave kisses. And it's not to say that didn't happen. But when I look back overall, I just feel so sad that I feel like that whole year was just like whoosh, like and I was just surviving. Both Najwa and Dimitri say they wish they'd known about possible postpartum mental health problems. But between birthing classes and regular prenatal check-ins, the issue wasn't really covered. You know, they taught me how to, like, put a diaper on. They taught me how to put the kids in the car seat. But they never, nobody ever said, hey, by the way, your your wife might have postpartum. Like, this is, these are the things to look out for. Maybe, like, a warning about it. I mean, I guess I probably should have maybe known, but... Of all the things that they taught us and talked about, I don't think that postpartum was brought up even. I think had I gone into it with that even like maybe thinking it was potentially a possibility, maybe then I would have caught the signs or even like learned a little bit about it. Maybe I would have been um, more understanding about what she was going through. Najwa, Dimitri, Pavel, and Winona are doing great. The twins are funny and curious. They never stopped moving during my visit. And the parents are one of those couples who are good friends on top of being strong partners. I asked Najwa for a final thought and what she most wanted people to know about postpartum depression. She says they need to take it seriously. And to like really notice when new moms are struggling. And even if it, you know, really is just a the two-week baby blues or it is you know, 10 to 12 months of postpartum depression, like, regardless of where someone is on that scale, like, just be present for them and um, show up for them. Like, it's okay if you don't know how to show up, but just, just show up. It does get better, and it might take a while, but, like, there really is a beautiful other side. For Call to Mind, I'm Jessica Bari. You're listening to Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from American Public Media's Call to Mind. I'm Kimberly Adams. My postpartum depression journey started at the start of the pandemic in 2020 after the birth of my oldest daughter, when my general anxiety morphed into a pretty severe case of postpartum depression. Lauren's the mom of two girls and lives in Woodbury, Minnesota. I was first screened for it at one of my daughter's pediatrician visits, and I immediately checked all the boxes for postpartum depression and was referred back to my OB. The plan was for me to immediately go on Zoloft, which I decided to decline any sort of medical intervention and try to handle it on my own through meditation and sleeping more and taking a vitamin regimen, which I thought was just going to solve everything. And in fact, did not and led to not only severe postpartum depression, but a load of other things on top of that, including postpartum insomnia, excessive drinking to help even sleep at night, and just a lot of unhealthy habits that led me to one of the darkest places that I have ever been. Um, Even my husband was scared to the point that he would lock himself in a room with our daughter some nights because my mental health was so um, on the decline. And I think one of the biggest things that is preventing people from talking about this more is just this taboo around it. It wasn't until I really turned to my family and said, actually, I really need help that we were able to find a good therapist for me, medication, and other tools to help solve my postpartum depression. Until recently, the best treatment for postpartum depression was standard medications like Zoloft or Prozac. But these antidepressants can take months to work. Then, about five years ago, the first treatment specifically for postpartum depression won approval. But it was an IV treatment that required the patient to be hospitalized for a 60-hour infusion. A major breakthrough happened in 2023. A prescription pill for postpartum depression was approved by the FDA. It's the first medication of its kind. 
It's called Zoranolone, and it represents a medical breakthrough in treating postpartum depression. Reporter Sarah Wyman tells us more. Good job, Victoria. This is what a typical morning sounds like for Christina Leos in a suburb south of Dallas, Texas. Mommy! What, babe? 13-month-old Victoria bangs a wooden mallet on a colorful xylophone while her brother Joseph jets across the living room. He's building a train. Leos is doing her best to help both of them at the same time. Mommy, this is upside down. You gotta contort it this way. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. I have a six year old, a four year old, and then my baby, who I had last March. She's the one that I had postpartum depression with. Leos says she was diagnosed with postpartum depression after her oldest daughter was born, too. But that time, it only lasted a couple of months, and her symptoms responded to a low dose of an anti-anxiety medication and therapy. After Victoria was born, it felt different. There were many times I remember I was driving and I was like, I don't care if I get in a car accident, you know, like, I didn't care what happened to me. I didn't, I didn't, like, actively seek out doing anything bad to myself, but... I just didn't care about myself anymore. Laos is a nurse in a neonatal intensive care unit. She's seen parents with postpartum depression as part of her job. But 10 months after her baby was born, she says she still felt like she was in a fog. She was irritable and had a hard time concentrating. Laos says she was meeting with a psychiatrist at least twice a week. She said, you know, I don't really know what else we can do medication-wise. She said I could do ketamine, ECT, like the shock therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. And then she also talked to me about inpatient or partial rehab treatment center. So I Googled ketamine and the shock therapy and I was just reading about it and I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm at this point in my life. A couple of weeks before Christmas, Leo saw online that the FDA had just approved a drug to treat postpartum depression. Zoranolone. It's being marketed under the name Zerzuve. Leos asked her psychiatrist about it. I said, you know, I have heard about this new medication that's out. Do you know how I can get it? And she was like, let me find out for you because I don't know when you could possibly be a good candidate. Zoranolone is the second drug developed by Sage Biogen Therapeutics to treat postpartum depression. But unlike the first medication, which involved an IV infusion administered over 60 hours, Zoranolone is an oral medication that can be taken at home. It works by providing a synthetic replacement for some of the hormones the body generates a lot of during pregnancy, but that sometimes drop off immediately after giving birth. And specifically, zoranolone replaces a hormone that helps to calm anxiety. Dr. Misty Richards is a reproductive psychiatrist at UCLA, and she calls this hormone a sledgehammer for panic attacks. And imagine you give birth and this calming kind of hormone in your body leaves, leaves in a hurry. It's the worst physiologic experiment of all time. Richard says one of the groundbreaking things about this drug is that patients can start to feel a difference within days. That's compared to other antidepressants like SSRIs, which can take four to six weeks to become effective. This medication truly, like I was talking to somebody else about this when it first came out, it really could be a game changer, not just for postpartum depression, but also for depression. In clinical trials, women who took Zoranolone showed significant improvements compared to a placebo group by day 15 of taking the drug, and as early as day three. Christina Leos says she started to sense a difference within two to three days. And it was nice because every day I would feel better and better. I could just be in the moment with my kids and feel love and feel joy that I hadn't felt for, what, 10 months by now. Laos did experience some of Zoranolone's common side effects, which can include drowsiness, dizziness, common cold, diarrhea, feeling tired, weak, or having no energy, and urinary tract infection. She did not breastfeed her baby during the two weeks she was on the medication, since Zoranolone passes into breast milk, and its effect on babies is not yet known. In some ways, it's hard to talk about Zoranolone without sounding like a drug company ad— But so many people outside of the pharmaceutical industry are rooting for this drug. One of them is Wendy Davis, the executive director of Postpartum Support International. I'm a psychobiology major who had postpartum depression and is now trying to raise awareness and treatment options for people. I'm so excited and I only hold back so I don't sound like a a sales rep. 
Davis is quick to emphasize that xeranolone is only one tool in a larger set of options that are also effective in treating postpartum depression, like talk therapy, stable housing and food assistance, other medications. But as with all of these approaches, Davis worries that xeranolone won't reach everyone who needs it. I'm really excited about innovative treatments, but if that innovative treatment exists and no postpartum woman knows about it or knows how to access it, I'm not so excited. And there's another problem. Xeranolone is expensive. As of December, when the drug went on the market, the manufacturer's cost is a little less than $16,000. And at this early stage, insurers are still developing policies on how they're going to cover Xeranolone. Dr. Ian Bennett is a researcher at the University of Washington who works with vulnerable and low-income communities. And he's worried this high cost means many people who need Xeranolone won't be able to get it. For tribal communities, for those that have been historically and currently disadvantaged and underserved, those cost barriers will be an issue. Bennett works in federally qualified health centers, where he says most of his patients are either uninsured or on Medicaid. And he says physicians like him, who work for public health organizations with limited annual budgets, will be challenged in prescribing this medication. Because if they get the money to cover it, that money is being shifted away from care somewhere else along the line. Care that might actually be vital to flagging parents for postpartum mental health care in the first place. I raise it not because I don't want people to use these medications and feel like it's hopeless. I raise it because there is a larger issue around the way we organize our treatments for the populations at highest risk of the worst outcomes. And those folks are not going to be able to benefit from that particular medication as much because those folks won't be identified Sage Biogen Therapeutics said in a comment, Coverage across all payer segments traditionally takes time. We are actively engaged with national, regional, and government payers to deliver broad and equitable access and encouraged that government and commercial payers are beginning to develop policies. The company has launched a financial assistance program to help patients afford their drug. That program includes a savings card, which can be used to cover the copay after a patient's insurance pays at least some of the cost of the drug. Christina Leos says that's the program she used to pay for her prescription. Her psychiatrist got in touch with the drug company, and the medication was shipped to her by a specialty pharmacy a few days later. And so how much have you paid out of pocket now for this drug? I paid zero dollars. Wow. Wow. Now, a representative from Sage Biogen Therapeutics first put us in touch with Christina Leos. But Leos says she's the one who reached out to the company. One night I was just going on Facebook and I was like, I'm going to look up this company. I just posted on their page and I was just like, I thank you guys so much for this drug because it literally saved my life and it saved me. And I just, I wish there was more knowledge about it. (laughs) Dory, jump, 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 jump. In March, Laos and her family celebrated Victoria's first birthday. She's grown up into a happy toddler who Laos says loves going for walks and eating just about anything. Indian food, Chinese food, I mean, you name it, barbecue, peas, beans. There's your cactus. Laos is doing better, too. She's back at work, and she's relieved to be able to do normal things again, like cook, clean, and meet up with friends. In the family's home videos, you can hear her laugh from behind the camera. (laughs) And Christina Leos says that's why she wanted to share her experience. So other parents know there's hope. It's such an isolating disease. And so I just want people to know that there are other people that have been there and it will get better. For Call to Mind, I'm Sarah Wyman. You are listening to Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from Call to Mind. I'm Kimberly Adams. I am a mom to my almost two-year-old son and experienced severe postpartum depression and anxiety after giving birth to my son in 2022. I knew that I was at high risk of developing a perinatal mental health condition because of my previous diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder and depression. I had trouble bonding with my son. 
I felt as if I was a terrible mother, and I felt extremely anxious that I was not doing enough for my son. I had experienced depression before, so I knew that what I was feeling was not the baby blues, and I knew that I needed to get the correct support in order to begin my recovery. I sought help with the help of my husband, OBGYN, therapist, and the support groups at Postpartum Support International. That was Shivani, a mom living in Phoenix, Arizona. In New York City, Dr. Lucy Hutner specializes in reproductive psychiatry. Hutner works in a small but growing field, focusing on the well-being of people as they go through different reproductive transitions. She says attention to reproductive mental health is long overdue. In 2016, a landmark study was done showing that pregnancy changes the brain. Terrific! Incredibly important study. Then we have to think, why was that study not done in 1977? Why is it 2016 when we're finding out basic things about the way that the brain works in somebody who is pregnant? What we know about in medicine reflects what is valued in medicine. And what we don't know in medicine reflects what is not seen or heard and by extension valued. We saw people giving birth and suffering needlessly, and a whole bunch of us decided that we weren't going to take it anymore. And I love it now because, you know, now within, you know, standard medicine, people understand that postpartum mental health and reproductive mental health is an important thing to pay attention to, but that was not the case 10 to 15 years ago. Dr. Lucy Hutner told us she got into medicine to find solutions and not watch problems. So after years of hearing patients struggle to get perinatal mental health care, she wanted to reach more people who needed help. Dr. Hutner co-founded an online support system called Phoebe. It builds community while delivering care from vetted providers. I think I had seen my 1,000th patient who had said something so similar, which was, I can't get out of bed. I feel like I'm a terrible mother. It's all my fault. And then they're depressed and they're consumed by self-guilt and and self-blame. And recognizing that I was seeing these patients on an individual level, and yet they all share these same systemic problems with lack of support, lack of community, and lack of information, right? Even when they have a question, they go onto Google and they're like, okay, how do I deal with my postpartum depression? Or frankly, how do I even deal with this newborn baby? And they go and it's a sea of information. Dr. Hutner explained that Phoebe is a resource for people who need support during pregnancy, postpartum, and even during the transition back to work. Basically what we do is we collect a group of people who are all giving birth around the same time, within two months of each other. All of the members are now part of like a 40-person team. And then what we do is we surround them with a group of about 20 experts. These are lactation consultants, psychologists, birth doulas, psychiatrists, infant care specialists, obstetric providers. We come in and do consultations as well. And what this group of experts does is they lead the team of people through the end of pregnancy, into postpartum, and they support them with 24-7 support through six months postpartum. And basically what it does is it serves as a safety net, providing the level of education and information, providing community of people who are going through the same thing at the same time, a huge amount of support. And we also celebrate each person's birth. What's the cost uh, involved? And, you know, is it something that gets covered by insurance? Who pays? Yes. Who's it available to? One of the things that I felt very strongly about was making something, a product that was really accessible to people. Phoebe is several hundred dollars, uh, ranging from about 300 to about $500. But that is for six months of care, 24-7 care. So someone who frankly, has a regular job. People who are there giving birth who don't have $700 to spend on a psychiatrist visit or, you know, accessing some expensive doula or whatever. And the magic of the way that we created our business model is because it's all done in groups, 
that is the reason why we could charge such a low price point. And the fun thing about the group too is that we make it entirely voluntary. So there are some members who join the team and, you know, they just want information and maybe they just want to know about the proper way to care for an infant. Then we have some people who are at every single Zoom meetup, who are constantly talking in the WhatsApp groups, who are totally involved. They're cheering everybody on, but we leave it up to them. It's completely voluntary. For us, this is a support network. This is a safety net and people use it how they see fit. Some companies offer it as an employee benefit. A final word from Dr. Hutner. I say to my patients all the time, there's going to be a solution here and we're going to find it. I think the difficulty is that when there's not enough information, people will fill that vacuum of information with fear. This situation exists anyway. Postpartum depression is the number one complication of childbirth. So if I have a patient who's fairly high risk, before giving birth, we'll have a series of maybe three sessions that talk about like, hey, these are the things to watch out for. Here are some early warning signs. Because when people feel that they have the information, that then gives them the power to make a plan. And when they have a plan, that reduces anxiety because it gives them the tools that they need to feel that there's agency. That was Dr. Lucy Hutner, a psychiatrist who specializes in reproductive mental health care. She's based in New York City. As we worked on this program, the experts we spoke to said there's a greater awareness of postpartum mental health conditions than ever before. Treatments have advanced and there are more options for care. The stigma surrounding postpartum depression has eased. But even with all this progress, there's still much more to do. I think there's a silver lining to my story that I was able to get help and I finally feel heard, validated, and understood. I'm so grateful for the care that I received to help me regain my wholeness. It is not a weakness to ask for help. Just know it does get better. You've been listening to Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special from Call to Mind, American Public Media's initiative to foster new conversations about mental health. We'd like to thank every person who shared their stories with us. This program wouldn't be possible without your voices. Remember, if you or someone you know is struggling, trained help is available. Call or text 988 and you'll be connected to a crisis counselor as soon as possible. Support for this program is provided by the Sozo Safe Foundation and the David and Laura Lovell Foundation. This program was produced and written by our senior producer, Jessica Bari, and edited by Stephen Smith. Our technical director is Josh Savage. Chris Julin and Annika Best provided production support, and this show was hosted by me, Kimberly Adams. Follow Call to Mind on our social channels at Call to Mind Now, and find resources and all of our past programs on our website at calltomindnow.org. Thank you for joining us for Birth and Depression, The Unspoken Conversation, a broadcast special by Call to Mind from American Public Media.